day of our week of prayer. And I believe and pray that all of us will be blessed as we uh, listen to the word of God. Now, in continuation of our um, worship, let us all uh, turn to our song number 41, Lord, I Need You. Song number 41. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you for everything that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for the abundant blessings that you shower upon us each day, Lord. Now as we come together here, Lord, to worship you in your holy place, Lord, please pour upon us your Holy Spirit, Lord, into each of our heart, Lord. Bless us, Lord, and help us so that we may be able to uh, open our hearts and minds to receive thy words, which uh, your servant has prepared for us, Lord. We pray that you will be with us till the end of this worship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
I'll zoom in to only her. Okay, zoom in to her. Uh, at this time, we have a special song uh, rendered to us by the Gate Band. So I would like to hand over the time to the Gate Band. No check, 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 no check, check. i 
Um, I'd like to thank the Gate Band for presenting to us a, a melody, a song, and I pray that God will continue to bless you all as you minister for him uh, with your beautiful voices. Now I hand over the time to Pastor Das uh, for the introduction of our speaker. Good evening, everyone. After the day's preparation and contemplating for this special location, I'm sure you are glad to be here, and I too. This evening, it's my privilege to welcome <coughs> the guest speaker. Uh, before I say something about him, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mrs. Shirley Bagian, Joanne, and Jonathan to come forward. Come up here, please. You can come and stand here. And I would also like our guest speaker to come and join them. Thank you very much. We would like to give them a warm welcome, though it's not as cold as Meghalaya, but still, maybe toward morning, it's a little bit cold. So may I request the team to come forward and uh, give them a warm welcome. You will understand what it means to give them warm welcome. Please come forward. This is Jonathan, uh, David's friend. And if you do not know David, you can go to Pastor Bay's house to find him. And this is Madam Shirley. Uh, uh, Mrs. Shirley Bagian is mother of Jonathan and Joanne. And our guest speaker, of course, I'm going to speak about him in a little while. So thank you very much for accompanying your husband and your father. Thank you. Please go ahead. <coughs> Dr. Paul Bhagyan is a man of God. I do not want to say much about him. You will hear him as he shares the word of God. That will challenge all the missionaries. And uh, by this, I do mean the missionaries who are being trained, and the campus family who are known by this title called missionaries. We all are missionaries. So he, his word is going to challenge all of us for this particular time. Uh, he is from a wonderful family. Father has been a teacher all his life. And in fact, if you know Dr. Guy Quard, who retired from IS, as a professor, department head, acting president, so many posts he had. He's a professor too, his teacher too, his father, uh, Pastor Paul's father. And we had wonderful time in the Philippines during our graduation, he had come there. I saw him for the first time and I was amazed. And so I believe that the Lord has chosen him. When we were discussing about finding somebody, immediately I said, Pastor, um, uh, Dr. Paul, and would you like to invite him? Right there, sitting there, I gave a phone call, 
And after the phone call, Pastor Chipem was wondering, how come you're not requesting him? He said, I do not need to request him. I can only tell him. And instantly he accepted this call to come here. And uh, much contemplated and prayed uh, for this special occasion. We certainly need uh, a real person who would give a real challenge to the people, to this missionaries, particularly 28th batch, particularly 28th batch. And uh, <coughs> we have international student as well from uh, in this 28th batch, uh, you can see, and uh, you will interact uh, with him as well. So he has gone through the portals of Spicer Memorial College, which is now Spicer Adventist University. Prior to that, he has his education, but uh, we met him in IAS, A-I-I-A-S, they call it IAS, <laughs> and that is uh, Advanced Institute of the Seventh-day Adventist in the Philippines, and he has completed his PhD thereafter. He was given a call to uh, serve in Spicer College, where he also served as the pastor of the church. And now he's the vice chancellor of Northeast Adventist University, the second university of the Seventh-day Adventist in Southern Asia Division. And uh, he, though he holds a very high profile, yet he is loved by all and beloved of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at this time, we give him this time to share the message that he has for all of us. Thank Pastor Das for um, the kind introduction. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm worthy of such introduction, but I want to thank you for lavishing your words on me. Um, I praise God for this opportunity that we could all come together and dwell on His Word and the providence that brings us all together this evening. Um, I praise God for that. I would have never thought that this would be a one day etched in the plans of God for me to be here this evening to present God's word to all of you. Um, I remember this time, my mind goes back to the time when I did a week of prayer for the Thousand Missionary Movement in the Philippines. Um, and that was a beautiful experience for me to interact with young missionaries and also to be a part of that beautiful event. And here I am, um, the Indian chapter of the Thousand Missionary Movement. And um, God is wonderful in the way God has been leading each one of us. I want to bring you greetings from the Northeast Adventist University. Um, as you will all know, this is of baby institution that was established just a couple of years ago. We are in the fourth year running this institution now. 
and we have been seeing God's hand leading us every step of that journey to where we are today. And we give God all the praise, glory, and honor. And we thank you for your support uh, in raising up prayers on our behalf as we run the educational ministry of the Adventist Church through our institution of higher learning at Northeast Adventist University. And I want to solicit your continued support and your prayers on behalf of all of us there and our team there um, as we take care of young people just like here. Um, we have a number of our young people coming together to study in our institution. The theme chosen for this week, I believe, is God's leading, and I believe it is mission-centric, mission focus. Therefore, I'm going to start with a very broad understanding of what it takes for us to be in an institution ordained by God as students, as faculty members, as staff members, joining hands together to fulfill the missional cause God has given to us as a church. Missional education, what it means for us. The primary object of Adventist education. Eighteen fifty-three, just a short history. Martha Byington, the daughter of the future General Conference President John Byington, would open the first Adventist Church School uh, in the United States. Eighteen seventy-two, in Battle Creek, Michigan, United States, Goodloe Harper Bell opens the first school sponsored by the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and you should know this name of. Uh, Harper Bell, he's probably the first educator that the Adventist Church would ever have, okay? Um, 1874, Battle Creek College, the first Adventist college opens up uh, in the United States, you know, and enrolls both male and female students. 1881, the first Adventist textbook, a natural method in English. Did you know that? That would be the first textbook that would be written, uh, produced by Goodlow Harper Bell, okay? 1887, the General Conference creates the Office of the Secretary of Education for the first time, appointing W.W. W. Prescott to the position in addition to his responsibilities as the president of the Battle Creek College. 1895, Battle Creek Sanitarium establishes the first Adventist School of Medicine. Um, and you know John Harvey Kellogg, a very important personality that would shape Adventist education, especially in the field of medical science. 1896, back here in India, the first school for Hindu girls was established in Calcutta, India. It was held on the first floor of the mission house under the guidance of Georgia Burris and May Taylor. Very important to young women workers who would shape the course of Adventism in India. Okay? Therefore, I want to present to you that the Adventist church is essentially an educational church. We believe in the ministry of education. In other words, we believe in ministry as education. Did you catch that? We believe in the ministry of education. Not just that. We also believe that ministry is education. We believe in education as ministry. Matthew chapter 21, 23, talking about Jesus, it says, And he entered the temple. The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was what? Teaching. While he was teaching. 
Jesus was constantly engaged in ministry, whether it was healing or teaching. Very important. Matthew chapter 26, 55. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day, I used to sit in the temple doing what? Teaching. And you did not seize me. Mark chapter 12, 35. And Jesus began to say as he taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? So Jesus constantly, every day of his life, he was actually engaged in the teaching ministry. Luke chapter 19, 47. He was teaching daily in the temple. Did you catch that? Jesus was on a mission, right? And he was on a mission teaching people every day that he lived on this earth. Jesus believed in the teaching ministry and ministry as teaching. That's what I want to humbly submit to all of us. We are all engaged, whether you're a faculty member or you're, going, you're training yourself to be a missionary. Remember, this is a work God is calling us to do in the teaching ministry of God. That takes us to the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach, what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever I have commanded, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. One of our early pioneers would write like this, wherever the work of our church has spread, what has happened? There we have also what? Established schools and encouraged education. Because we believe as a church that ministry is about teaching. And we'll get to know why we do that. So why we ask ourselves this question. Why should the SDA church spend crores of dollars and rupees on educational institutions in the world and in India? Why should we invest so much in our schools and colleges and universities? Why should we care to establish SDS schools and colleges and universities when there is no dearth to educational institutions in the world? Or even in India, we have hundreds and thousands of institutions. So why care for another institution? Unless, of course, there is a unique purpose. How can we justify such expenditure in the light of the other pressing needs of the church and the world that it serves, right? We have so many other needs that we need to cater to. So why should we as a church spend so much time and effort and money on establishing schools and investing into our schools? And here is a beautiful campus. Why, why should we build up this infrastructure right here? the school building, cafeteria, you know, and this beautiful place. Why? Why Why spend so much money into all of this? The establishment and existence of Adventist educational institutions are justifiable only, and only if Adventist schools serve a distinct and important purpose. No other reason why we should start up schools today We have two universities. Northeast Adventist University is one. Why should there be another university? Did you know that India has hundreds and thousands of um, institutions? Why should we have another one? And I want to submit. Aimless education is what? Useless education. If you're here sitting in this place and you came here to just study 
uh, not knowing exactly why you're here, I want to say that it is aimless. Whether you are teaching or a student, if you are aimlessly part of this institution, it is a useless time for you and the institution. But I want to go further. Aimless education is not just useless. What is it? It is also dangerous education. I'll tell you why. Ellen White writes, by a misconception of the true nature and object of education, many have been led into serious and fatal errors. If we don't know why we run our institutions and why we're here in the first place as students and teachers, we can run into dangerous problems. And one of the problems is that we can lead others and including our students and and our colleagues into serious and even fatal errors. Nine-tenths of the calamities which have befallen the human race had no other origin than the union of, underscore this, union of what? High intelligence with low desires. That's a lethal combination. Dangerous, high intelligence, low desires. Combined with low desires, education has often proved to be a curse. That's why I say aimless education is what? Dangerous education. Educational aims give direction to the education process, motivates us, and provides criteria for evaluating progress. Purpose affects every aspect of education. So why are we here is a big question. Why are you here in this institution, in this movement, in this college that you belong to, on this campus? Why are you here, part of this movement, this workforce, this student body? Why are you here aimlessly? or with a purpose. So we ask the question, what is the aim of Adventist education? The true function of schools is to develop intellectual abilities. Is that what it is? To prepare young people for the work of the world? What is it really? The most fundamental aim of Christian education is what? Develop character. And I believe that's why you are here. That's what should motivate you, drive you to come to Adventist institutions. I want to be a better person. I want to know God's purposes for my life. I want to mold my life in accordance to the life of Christ. That should be the only reason why we should pursue Adventist education. Ellen White writes, the great work of parents and teacher is what? Character building. A knowledge of sciences sinks into insignificance besides this great aim but all true education may be made to help in the development of a righteous character. Nothing more, nothing less. All true education must be made to help in the development of a righteous character. That should be the ultimate goal for all of us. God, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to wear the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives me, not by my might, but by his grace. That should be our goal. To prepare young people for service. I believe that's why some of you have chosen to come here to a thousand missionary movement or even to the college 
you want to serve God. We want God to use us as his vessels of mercy to those around us. Service. Not to be served, but to serve. The true object of education is to fit men and women for service by developing and bringing into active exercise all their faculties. And that's where we bring in the Adventist philosophy of education of looking at a holistic way, holistic development of all the faculties of an individual. The true object of education is to fit men and women for service by developing and bringing into active exercise all their faculties. And this is a wonderful place, I believe, where you can develop all the faculties for the, for the cause of God. Some of, our, some of you are into music. Some of you, I believe, are enabled by the Spirit of God with talents, with gifts, charismatic gifts, to use it in the purpose of God. And I believe through this week of prayer, as we deal with different subjects that, that align with the mission of this church, I believe, I hope and pray that it will awaken in you a sense of accountability, a sense of responsibility that God has so very solemnly entrusted into our hands. True education prepares students for the joy of service in this world and higher joy of service in the world to come. But all of these, are they really the primary object of Adventist education? So let's get back to the basics here. Why do we need education? And why must education be missional? Why should it be redemptive? Why should our education be transformational? And here is the reason why. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The purpose of God in creating humanity was lost with a fall, right? Ever since sin came and evaded this earth, we have lost purpose, the purpose that God ordained for us. The change that took place in human condition at the fall, God's plan for yet fulfilling his purpose in the education of human race. And that's why it's critical. That's why it's central to education to reform man into the very image of God. God created us in his image. We fell short of that image. And now God has designed for the church and all the educational institutions ordained by him to remold, to refashion, to reshape man and to reform man into the very image that God has made, made us in the first place. That's the purpose of Adventist education. If you're sitting here today, folks, and you're wondering, why am I, what am I doing here? Uh, I came expecting something and suddenly uh, it's not what I wanted. Is this where you should be? I want to challenge you today. I believe this is no accident why you're here. God purposed that you should be here in this institution. Why? Because God wants to reform you, to remold you, to become what you God has in mind for you. The first and constant aim of Christian education thus for Christian teachers on whatever level you are, the first effort and constant aim should be, first of all, and I hope I'm speaking to teachers here. What is the aim? To aid students in comprehending the principles the biblical principles that God has outlined for us in his holy word. Second one, to enter into that relationship with Christ, which will make these principles a controlling power in the life of our students, the life of our children, the life of the youth, 
the life of the church members that God has graciously given under our care. Ellen White reiterated often that all important things in education should be the all important, the most important thing in education should be what? Can you say that after me? What is that? Should be the conversion of students. Oh, I'm already an Adventist. Why should I be converted? When I mean conversion, I mean all of us need this, right? We all need it whether you're born into an Adventist family or not. We all need to have an encounter with our Lord and Savior. We all need to have that conversion experience. Yes, you may, be, have, you may have been born into an Adventist home. Maybe you are a third generation Adventist, a fifth generation Adventist. Doesn't matter at all. We all need to find ourselves reconverted to have that sustaining, saving relationship with Christ. In fact, I believe there's a danger with so much of familiarity and would be say, oh, I'm already an Adventist, and therefore I can just, you know, go to church every Sabbath and do my normal thing. But, that, but we all need to have this true regeneration happening in our lives to be converted, to, to accept Jesus, to take a stand for Jesus, to say to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to be not just the crucified Savior, but I want you to sit on the throne of my heart every day, taking the decisions for me. I want you to reign in my life. We want Jesus to reign in our lives. You know, sometimes uh, we, we like Jesus to be the, the Savior on the cross. We, we love that image. We like to sing about the cross but sometimes it's so hard for us to follow his dictates on our lives, right? Just be honest with yourself. How many, how many times have we failed Christ? We, we'd rather take our own decisions. But to have Jesus sit on the throne in our decision-making process and, and expect Jesus to run our lives is another thing. We'd rather have it our way. But this is what true education should help us, to convert ourselves. Ellen White writes, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption, and this is the object of education, the great object of life. So the work of redemption and the work of education is one, one and the same, isn't it? The work of redemption and the work of education is one and the same. The fundamental aim of education to restore broken relationship between God and the student sets the educational agenda and curriculum. All the other purposes of education are enlightened and molded by this primary purpose. The lostness of man provides the purpose of Christian education. Man's greatest need is to become unlost, right? We all have this. We are all lost, but we have an urge within us to be unlost, to find our Savior, to be found by Him. In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one because both built directly upon Jesus Christ. The work of education and the work of redemption is one and the same. Whether you're a minister, missionary, whether you're a missionary teacher or a medical missionary, whether you're doing, uh, you're here as a student or whether you're a faculty member, whether you're out there going to be prepared to go out and be a missionary for God, the work is the same. The work is the same. And that is to convert people. 
to aid the student in entering into that relationship with Christ, which will make them a controlling power in the life, should be the teacher's first effort and his constant aim. The teacher who accepts this aim is, in truth, a co-worker with Christ, a laborer together with God. Ellen White writes that. You know, sometimes we have the impression that only if you're an evangelist, you're doing the work of God. But I believe even teachers, you are an evangelist and your mission field is your classroom. We have a work to do, and that is to bring young people to the foot of the cross to meet the Savior. George Knight a church historian, she, he writes like this, Christian education is the only education that can meet man's deepest needs because only Christian educators understand the core of the human problem. And what is a problem? We all have fallen short of the glory of God. The redemptive aim of Christian education is what makes it Christian. The primary aim of Christian education in the school, the home, and the church is to lead young people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, period. That's all it is, to lead young people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. He further writes, education is part of God's great plan of redemption or atonement. The role of education is to help bring man back to a one, at oneness with God his fellow man, his own self, and the natural world. The whole message of the Bible points forward to the day when the work of restoration will be complete and the Edenic condition will be restored in the realm of nature because of the healing of man's manifold loss, lostness. And this, I believe, is the core of the problem that we are dealing with, the sin problem, to bring us back into the Edenic perfection that God created us in. So I want to ask you this question as we conclude our session this evening. Why are you here? I don't know if you've seen this picture before. Have you seen this picture before? This is an iconic picture. Um, I love this picture because this is the, probably the first batch of missionaries that came to India way back in 1940, um, I'm sorry, 1894, 1895, 96, and we, this is the place where we established the first school. It was my privilege to hunt for this place just a couple of years ago. I wanted to find this place, and so I called up my professor, Dr. Christo, and I said, so I, I need to find this place. This is in Calcutta. Um, so I got uh, into a taxi and found this place uh, and I was pleasantly surprised that this building is still there, you know, and uh, I believe this is a very historic place where it all began for us in India. Mission work began from this place and all these missionaries standing here, D.A. Robinson, W.A. Spicer, uh, Georgia Burris, you know, all these individuals who came selflessly to put their lives so that today, if we look back and say, because of these individuals, we have an institution like this. We have young people willing to serve God. If not for the sacrifice of these individuals, a number of them would, lo would lose their lives. For D.A. Robinson, for example, he lost his life a couple of years after he came, but he worked so hard, buried in Karmatar. Today, he stands as a symbol of self-sacrifice. A number of them here would render selfless service all of their lives to this uh, heathen land at that time and still is. We have a long way to go before India comes to know of Jesus fully. We have masses of people to reach out to. And young people, you're here today 
by providence, by a providence, God brought you here, not by an accident. And I hope one day people can look up and say, this, this person, I know he, he was a missionary here in the Thousand Missionary Movement. He, because of what he did, because of his teaching, his life, his practice, today I, am, I have come to know my Savior, Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be a wonderful experience for us to hear words? And even if we don't hear those words uh, on this side of heaven, I believe one day when Christ comes, we will all hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I believe God wants that for all of us. He wants us to be in that throng in heaven that will be proud of the way that God used them while they were on this earth. So why are you here tonight? Are you wasting your time? The answer is no. God brought you here. There is a greater purpose that you probably are not able to see at this time. But God has brought you here to fulfill the greater plan for this world, especially for our country, India. God has a plan through you. And it's my prayer that God, as you come to know of this Savior, and as you accept him into your hearts, and as you have that saving relationship with Jesus, you will fall in in love with him daily, time and again, enough so that you can truly be a reflection of who he is. May God bless us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen.